problems. Uh, you've got to have people who are champions of this. You know, that's, that's the key. Uh, and usually it's the clinicians who are the drivers of this. Um, so we have to have a sustainable data collection um, and we feed it into quality control systems. Uh, it's all cross-institutional. Uh, what we do is we have template agreements. Um, I'll explain it in a minute, which says that if, if two or three groups want to collaborate and share colorectal cancer, they go through the hospital boards for the, the ethical approval of this. There's a standard process to do it. So that you can determine that, yes, this is ethically correct research. It doesn't violate anybody's uh, data accesses. How much is needed to answer all this? So here's what typically happens. Um, this is how we've automated it. Um, we have to identify who owns the data. You know? um, where are the ma major sites with colorectal cancer? Are people willing to share it? Um, then we have to develop the data sets, data items. Have a, often these people have stored their data in what we consider um, a DBA's ultimate nightmare, which are things like access databases, which are an, an evil that was visited on the world by Microsoft. Um, you know, because the data is not normalized, it's not properly classified and so on. Um, we have to develop it, we build front ends, then we do data cleaning, data curation. Um, then we, we build a link at the site to extract the data out to what's called a local repository. Then we link it via a VPN to a federator. Um, we do linkage keys so that um, if Bill Appleby rolls up to one hospital and roll up another day to a different hospital, I can, I can clinically connect up those, which leads to some actually very interesting, once you can do that, the ability to link medical data creates you know, a raft of different applications that we're actually building right now. And you've got to have user access. You have to train the users. Uh, this is difficult because they're often clinicians. Um, they're, they're used to dealing with people, not computers. And you have to annotate the database, develop some standards. So I mean, the number of people that are involved in this project is actually pretty large, right? Um, and I'll just mention these data sets, then I'll, I'll skip over at this point. If people are interested, obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll give Jill and the conference organizers copies of these presentations. And, you know, Biogrid itself, their website, you know, it's got a lot of more information. But th here's the interesting effect and one point I want to make. This was all started by, by one group in colorectal cancer who are mad keen to say, we can do much better research if we can link our data together. So these are what I call the early adopters, the eager people. Once they had gone ahead and federated their data, what happened is they started to publish papers and people in other areas like you know, brain cancer, sarcoma and so on, all of a sudden say, oh well, boy, if we could just do that, oh, we paper with you know, 20,000 samples in it, oh, that's, you know, we need to do that. Why aren't we doing that, right? And all of a sudden, what, what became resistance then becomes like a stampede of people who are sort of you know, beating on their hospital administrator's door. Um, it's broadened out into neurosciences now, um, image processing, holding images. Um, diabetes is obviously a big one for us, um, tracking diabetes treatment, um, federating databases of diabetes data. Um, out of which, again, we've built some front-end tools that clinicians can use to use this. So, so this is one of the more exciting projects that's, that's going at the moment, which is I think it's always good to have cyber infrastructure success stories, right? They've got real people using it, publishing real data, uh, it was something which started as a, a relatively small, modest project, but it's really taken off. Okay. So back to the main show. Now it's probably going to back to the start again, but that's okay. Okay, so, so what I want to talk about now is some of the challenges of a national data grid, um, because it's obviously an extremely large project. I'll talk about the architecture and some of the challenges. Uh, well, the first question is what services should a, um, should a national data grid provide? Now, some of the universities had this, the misunderstanding or the misinformed view that all you needed to do was put a big pile of spinning disks in there um, you know, and, and run some sort of a file server and all of a sudden, magically, researchers would sort of come flying out of their laboratories you know, with their DVDs lining up like it was some sort of a, you know, a beer at a nice hockey game or something like that. You know, but no, it's not like that. Um, 
What you want to provide is both raw data archiving, staging and replication, guaranteeing for people that we can replicate and save your data. Uh, people are also interested in tools for publishing and sharing data, allowing other people to get access to it. Um, the other one which is a big issue is archiving of metadata, um, which are things like workflows that you use to generate it. You know, what sequence of commands did I run? Can I reconstruct that? Do I need to save all the intermediate results or not? Now the other question is where do you put all these data centers? Um, I guess I heard from some talks earlier on today that, that I should be putting all these in the Yukon or Yellowknife or something like that for environmental reasons. Um, but, but practically speaking, um, you know, we're looking at this problem because you, you need to put the data, you need to put the data centers very close to where the data is and where the compute is. So on major instruments like the Australian synchrotron uh, or high throughput sequencing. Um, the other problem, which is a real problem, is that software for data grids, um, IRODs and SRB is uh, not exactly stable, not ready for prime time. Um, I hope I'm not insulting anybody using that technology, but it's, it's moving. Um, saving workflows is a problem. It's, it, it's sort of provable, you know, if you're a computer scientist, that there's no way to, to, to provably save the workflow to recreate something because somebody could have read the wall clock and multiplied it by a random number. Okay, uh, funding is an in interesting one because the, the money which is in there is primarily just for infrastructure. So the universities are contributing people, as are we. Um, bandwidth is a big problem in Australia, as it is too. Um, 10 gig, will that cut it? Australia is a very big, empty country, right? Same problem as Canada. Everybody, everybody lives close to the border, in our case, the border of the ocean. Um, Security and privacy are a big problem, but, but at least we have some, some initial solutions for that. What we're proposing, uh, what's been agreed federally, is only about two to three data centers per state. You need two at least in order to provide replication. You need at least 10 gig connections between them. Um, typically co-investing with university data centers, uh, building on top of that. Um, next to the HPC facilities, um, in our case, um, we, we have a synchrotron in our backyard. They're always handy to have. Um, and I should mention one, one key advantage that we have, which is just by, by geographic fortune. Um, in the state of Victoria, there's one big city called Melbourne, and there are no rivals. Right? So it means that most of the universities are within 30 minutes of where we are located, and so that makes life much easier um, than even here, for example. Um, the other problem which you've got to, to realize is you have to synchronize software stacks and manage them nationally. One of the problems we found a lot with the grid early on, whether it's you know, West Grid or Canary, is that unless you've integrated these and got fairly good common software, common standards, commonality between them, unless you've got, which takes, West Grid has done, and they've had to build that up over a period of years. But if you have people that want to go off and do their own thing, especially with data, it's a nightmare, right? In the case of compute, if your job falls over, well, you just go and do it again. In the case of data, if your data is lost, you have very angry people. I mean, in our case, we had a, a major software failure in one of our disk systems, which took us out for about a week. You've got really unhappy users. Okay? And it, it's all due to a, a big blue company's problem, but I won't get into that. OK. Um, upgrades done by one organization. Um, that's the ARCS organization. Uh, the federal government's agreed that they're not just going to let the universities do their own thing and hope it works. Um, and there are lower levels of support for organized that want to, organizations that want less levels of support is the, the process. Um, automatic backup of files is not difficult. Backing up workflows is actually quite complex. Uh, it has to be done on a domain specific basis. So we work, for example, with nanotechnology groups looking at, at the experimental workflows they run. We work with people at the Australian Synchrotron, again, the same thing, you know, understand their workflows. It's also an opportunity to help automate people's workflows. One of the things that I think is a growing area in cyber infrastructure is that more and more of this multidisciplinary research requires you to run something on an instrument somewhere, move the data somewhere else, do some analysis on another tool. And so one of the big challenges for cyber infrastructure is trying to automate, in some sense, those manual processes. OK. And again, this all has to be built with the researchers. If you don't have anyone that's willing to work with you, don't even build it. 